My name is Nandi Wam Kwanazi, and I'm the head of sustainability and programs at Aero for Africa. We're looking to um, having a very engaging, thought-provoking, and insightful webinar. Um, you know, and we're looking to have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar where you can ask questions and um, you can have our esteemed speakers answer you and you know give you some words of wisdom. Again, thank you for joining us. Once again, greetings to everybody that is in the room. Thank you very much for joining our webinar. My name is Nandi Waram Kwanazi, and I'm the Head of Sustainability and Programs for Aero for Africa. We're very honored to have you um, join us um, for our webinar, which is titled Navigating the Future of Entrepreneurship in Africa. We're going to be discussing some insights what's currently happening on the African continent and um, you know, some future projections of where we see the ecosystem um, steering towards. Um, Aero for Africa is very invested, empowering and um, developing African entrepreneurs. And we've got various services um, on which we, um, we implement to ensure that um, we're building a very impactful and a very well-rounded holistical um, entrepreneur, but also businesses that are sustainable. Some of the services that we offer um, are training programs, one of which being um, the gender inclusive program, which is set to develop businesses and their founders in how to have a more inclusive and more um, mainstream, gender mainstream um, workplace. And we're looking to also implement a program called Just Transition under the banner of our sustainability offering where we are looking to develop business um, so that they can include strategies and policies within the businesses that are geared to a more 
for environmentally friendly and sustainable um, business. Without further ado, I'll introduce the speakers um, to our webinars. We've got um, a trailblazing entrepreneur called Thelma Chimwanga. She hails from Zimbabwe, but runs a global business called Beyond Borders Logistics. She was the co-founder and the CEO of this incredible business. Welcome, Thelma. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nandi. We also have Moses Iching, which is a young entrepreneur that is leading change within the agricultural land space. Um, he's using tech, you know, to bring innovations not only to African farmers, but to other um, farmers across the globe. Welcome, Moses, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nandi, uh, for the warm welcome. Um, Moses, if you can just um, give our attendees just a quick run through of, you know, what led you to start Invest the Farm and just the background um, as your um, as an entrepreneur and where you're looking to take your business in the future. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I started Invest the Farm back in, uh, I would say, 2020, 2020, 2020. 2023. So I've grown up with my mom and uh, seeing my mom uh, be part of women groups and not being able to access loans. And yet she was uh, she was a farmer. But now when she went to bank, banking institutions and microfinancial institutions, uh, it's either she found the process is very complicated or they did not find her critical enough to to get loans. So uh, looking into this and and generally just looking at the bigger picture where we have at least 70% of women uh, here in Kenya uh, who are involved in agriculture and yet are not able to, to access these financial services. I thought of an idea that would, number one, utilize the groups in which these women were part of as social collateral, and then build a solution that would enable them access uh, finances for their farming. So that's how, that's the whole idea behind Investor Farm. Although we have metamorphosized into something bigger, now focusing on different uh, customer or, or clients, but that was the whole idea behind Investor Farm, to be able to provide access to finance for women, the women that we, we felt were not getting these finances. So my background has been mostly in tech, uh, growing up and also just getting into university, uh, I, I, I worked uh, for some time into a tech company, but later moved on uh, to, to now focus more on, on projects. I uh, had my very first startup. I didn't go quite well before starting Investor Farm. So yeah, that, that has been basically my founder's journey along the way. Then in terms of what we're looking to build in the future. So we, we started back in 2020. I think we've had very good learning curve uh, from the basics of building a startup to uh, raising investment to incorporating the company not just in Kenya but in the UK and other countries as well that we are currently operationalized. Uh, so it's it's been it's been a learning journey along the way because there are so many factors you have to consider from capacity, market, understanding your customer, and all that. And yeah, we 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 see ourselves more of like a household name uh, when it comes to uh, providing financial solutions, especially in the agricultural sector. So specifically focusing on, on different sectors in agriculture. So whether it's transport uh, in a particular country, that's what we focus on, whether it's a particular crop that's doing well, so maybe it's yams in Nigeria, that is what we want to go and finance rather than just focusing on every crop because we want to more like maximize production of major crops uh, in different countries. Hmm, that's incredible. Um, so, you know, we from Aero for Africa, of course, have been keeping tabs on your journey because you are one of, um, you know, our very successful alumni. And, you know, you touched on a very critical um, point, especially for entrepreneurs within the continent when it comes to you know, how do you find investors and solutions that are geared towards a startup? And, you know, that's one of the services that we offer is Arrow for Africa through advisory, where, you know, we do business change, business growth, and we help, um, you know, investor-ready businesses be able to attract those investors. So hearing you speak so well about the journey so far since you started, um, you know, in 2020 is very inspiring. 
and of course motivates not only me, but I'm sure the people that are in the room. Thank you very much for that. Moses Thummer, um, if you can just tell, you know, um, the attendees in the group how you started your journey. We know that, you know, you're an award-winning entrepreneur. Uh, you're doing incredible things, um, not only within the continent, but of course you're helping um, connect businesses that are based on the continent with key markets, including China. So if you can just give us an overview of, you know, who Thama is and how you started Beyond Borders Logistics. Okay, thank you so much, Nandi, for the introduction. Thank you everyone who's joining us today. Um, my name is Thama, I'm currently serving as the CEO at Beyond Borders Logistics. We are headquartered in Zimbabwe. And my journey would probably take the whole day, uh, but I'll try to just um, summarize it. Um, I'm an entrepreneur in heart, and I believe that um, as an entrepreneur, be able to, you are able to thrive um, in any organization or in any project that you, you find yourself in. Uh, so I would say, well, my journey started um, when I was in university. I used to sell different things. Um, I had a canteen when I was in university. I had a mobile butchery. Uh, you used to do cakes. And um, my background is in entrepreneurship, marketing, and finance. I majored in finance when I was in university. And then I found myself transitioning to marketing because I was just able to do resource mobilization, business uh, development in identifying needs and markets. So years later, I got employed. The entrepreneurship journey didn't really work out after university, and I found myself employed. And I was employed for almost five years uh, in marketing and business development. I did quite well. But um, at the turn of 2018 in Zimbabwe, the economy took a downturn, and I found myself unemployed and did not have a plan. So as an entrepreneur, as a marketer, and also as a finance person, I realized that there was um, a market gap for e-commerce in Zimbabwe. And also in um, just before 2019, that's when COVID started. So I found myself unemployed at the height of, of COVID. And there were lockdown restrictions. Even if I tried to find another job, people were, organizations were downsizing, uh, people were being uh, laid off. So as an entrepreneur, I actually saw that as an opportunity because there were also many people who found themselves in a similar situation to myself where they are unemployed and had no other sources of income. So myself, I turned into buying and selling. But at the same time, because of the lockdown restrictions, there was need for a logistic solution, for a delivery solution. And many people also tend to buy and selling. But there was also another need of a way to source the products for buying and selling. So I did my research uh, together with my partner. Uh, we did some research and we found solutions in China. Uh, where we then start teaching people, uh, helping people how they can source uh, products, how they can procure from China, how can they do e-commerce business from China, drop shipping uh, from China. And we had to find another solution as well of how to get the products within Zimbabwe, within the rest of the region. And also people who were producing locally in Zimbabwe, they needed to get their products uh, to other markets. So we had to come up with a delivery solution. This is how Beyond Borders came into existence because we were trying to reach different markets. We were trying to help them meet as well to find new markets apart from just doing business in Zimbabwe. This is how we, we started and where we are going. Um, we are trying to, uh, to help have Africa more connected because previously, and I think even still now, it's difficult for you to buy, for example, shea butter from Ghana. We know that the best shea butter comes from Ghana, but how do you get it to South Africa? How do you get it to Zimbabwe, to Namibia? So we are trying to promote intra 
and in Africa trade uh, by reducing the shipping cost because uh, the cost of logistics is almost 30 percent um, the product cost in Africa. So we are now working towards a solution where um, Africa does business uh, by itself in a more reduced cost. Thank you very much for that. Um, what an incredible journey. And of course, it's very inspiring. And you know, you, you touched on some very critical points uh, when it comes to microeconomics and you know how they um, affect the end user. So, you know, as somebody that is working within the logistic um, logistics space, what are the current trends that you see that are um, you know shaping and influencing business? And of course, you obviously mentioned um, you know, a big, big, big game changer, which is COVID. Um, and of course, we see the global influence. Um, we saw what happened when there was the, the war that is still ongoing between Russia and Ukraine and how it affected the supply of wheat globally. And of course, how businesses, a lot of businesses are, are still, you know, dealing with a lot of instability that came from COVID. So, um, you know, as somebody that works, um, of course, within the continent and globally as well, what are some of the most uh, pressing uh, macro um, economics trends that you're seeing that will influence, um, you know, the growth of African businesses? Um, currently, maybe I'll start with um, what can really um, make that transition, the growth um, slow down. And currently we are, uh, we are grappling with infl inflation and currency fluctuations across uh, the continent. You find that in Zimbabwe, we're not immune to issues of currency fluctuations, and uh, Nigeria as well, Ghana as well. So I believe that um, if we can address uh, those issues uh, of in inflation, because it's difficult to price the price, uh, it's difficult to get a quotation to somebody because the next day the currency would have uh, changed the fortality of it makes it makes it difficult for for businesses and like um in in zambia as well the currency fluctuations have actually increased the cost of importing uh, raw materials and it affects even you know uh, the local production of goods because some of the raw materials we're not producing them locally we're not producing them within the continent so those fluctuations in in uh, in currencies as well as the looking at the macroeconomics worldwide, we've got the Red Sea um, issue going on, where we have pirates who are taking over ships. It's also affecting the global uh, macroeconomics at large. So I believe the trends that I'm seeing going forward, um, I'm seeing a lot of potential agribusiness in agritech, especially where we are able to provide um, solutions in terms of energy through solar energy i think there's a lot of potential coming through even in e-commerce uh, especially in southern africa and east africa we are seeing the emergence of mobile services they are transforming how business are do uh, business is being done uh, they, um, including especially the small to medium enterprises so i see potential in agri-tech and the digital economy Definitely. Um, you know, of course, as we know, um, one of our speakers, Moses, um, works specifically within the tech space and, of course, the agri space. So, um, Moses, with what Thelma has said, how are you seeing, um, you know, the rapid advancement that we're seeing of tech within the continent? You know, um, Thelma mentioned the advancements that's coming from East Africa. You, of course, being from Kenya, we know uh, from Pesa, we know some of the um, incredible innovations that are coming out from that part of the, um, the continent. How are you seeing the, um, those rapid um, tech um, transformations coming through? Of course, you know, we do know that we also um, are a continent um, that experiences some energy, some energy challenges. So we all know that you can't really have a tech advanced, um, you know, continent or nation without um, having proper and consistent connectivity. So how are you seeing the influence um, on tech, on businesses and what sort of opportunities um, to do entrepreneurs need to be more aware of that they may not necessarily be um, cognizant of? Uh, so uh, we, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of access to the internet and probably mobile penetration rates, currently in Africa it's estimated to be around 
and which uh, represents significant growth uh, from 2022, uh, 2020 to 2022 and 2023. Uh, also in terms of internet access, it's, it's grown and that's why we're seeing the likes of, of Glovo and, and, and other, other e-commerce kind of uh, companies and different industries being able to grow their e-commerce space. Something that uh, has really, I would say, has been a challenge for us at Investor Farm is being able to keep up with the technological advances as well as serve the customer. So knowing how to find a link between the two. So by that, what I mean is, are we able to enable people that can access the internet, be able to access our product that's been built on technologies like AI? Because if you look at how, uh, our, our product is built is that number one, it uses blockchain, which is a very foreign concept, uh, especially in Africa at the current moment. And what blockchain enables us to do is be able to receive uh, financial access from across the globe. So uh, our platform is basically peer-to-peer, -peer, so meaning we're able to get a larger capital base from outside outside Africa and then bring it here to, to, to different farmers. So getting it from outside there is much easier considering uh, the technological advancement. But now giving it to the farmer is a problem, number one, uh, because most of the farmers are not tech savvy enough. And how we've managed to go around that is uh, not really going the way of forcing technology uh, down their throats. Uh, what we've tried is build around them. So what we've done is now, instead of onboarding the farmers directly, we're now onboarding them through agricultural stores or agricultural centers where they most likely get their input. So onboarding, onboarding them indirectly and still being able to uh, deliver the value of the service uh, in which we intend to, to give to them through our company. Another thing uh, that I have seen has been helpful in the business and is also a technological advancement is on big data. So we need to find a way in which we can be able to use the data we have gotten from our previous operations to be able to uh, either increase our revenue or reduce our cost of production. So uh, with, with, with reduction on cost production, we've seen uh, uh, through customer segmentations or through uh, segmenting our, our previous customers, we're able to get that data and then we're able to optimize our marketing uh, marketing uh, ways so that we're able to ensure that we have uh, a good turnover when it comes to onboarding farmers. And also just in terms of, uh, in terms of identifying uh, new revenue streams as well, and also just looking at how we lose our customers. So generally looking at our churn rate, how does that look like? How, how do we lose our customers from, from this type of data information? How can we be able to save these customers that we're likely to lose at this period of time? Because now we have the information. So I believe advancement in technology in a way has been able to help us grow the business and also grow other SMEs because for, for us, I know in Kenya, data has become something that's so precious to most companies uh, in the sense that it can literally be a game changer on how you compete against different competitors. But again, uh, its implementation uh, has to be in a way that the customer uh, really benefits from, from it and is not left out of, of the entire pyramid. Hmm. Incredible, Moses. Um, you know, so one of the key things that you mentioned for me is, um, of course, data, which is very important um, for any business that is looking to grow in an impactful and sustainable business. And you do see a lot of people falling through the gaps. And unfortunately, you know, the consumer or the target market um, is not always in the forefront um, when we're developing all the engagements that we're doing. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that we at Arrow for Africa um, are very intentional about. So. Um, you, as a young entrepreneur who started your business, um, you know, using the background that you had, using the funds that you had, and of course the ingenuity and resilient spirits that you know we've seen you carry over the years. What are the, some of the the you know the the things that you think that you know um, a young entrepreneur that is starting a business needs to look out for when it comes to investor readiness and to be able to um, you know um, be able to access funding that you see. So I would, I would say there's not really a playbook to it in the sense of how I have gone around it because for me we'd, we've had to learn a lot uh, from uh, just general people management to 
uh, having your deal room ready. So there are these basics that obviously uh, are out there, like having your deal room, uh, doing your financial projections, especially at the, at the very start. I, I, I feel like when companies are starting off or when startups are starting off, there's not so much conversations around traction, especially when it comes to the investor. So it's more of like, do you have, do you have a product or an MVP that can be used to test a few customers? So it's more of like selling on the future, but again, you need to have like most of the things set out. So uh, if it's your data room, you need to have that order uh if it's your financials you need to have that in order if it's your team so team dynamics are also very important because i remember uh when we started off we kind of like did a personality test study within the team to just understand who does what and uh and also in terms of decision making and and energy so that we are able to give ourselves roles that would uh work, would, would uh, be stronger uh, according to our own uh, strength. So we, we sort of like build personality tests. So team team is very important. Uh, these uh, the financial projections. Uh, if if you have a wait list, that's fine. Uh, it would come a long way. Uh, also in in regards to having a working MVP, that's very important again. And also product market validation. So most people build in silos, which is kind of not okay, especially when you're starting off. Uh, you need to more like bring your product out there, taking criticism, because it's one one thing to have an idea, and it's another to actually have a working business out of it. So building building in public is has really helped us because we we used to go to events, we used to say we're building this, this is how we're doing it. Uh, we would love to have you on our wait list, or we would love to have you partner with us or probably uh, help us in accessing these resources. So at the very beginning, everything is more like really opened up. You can try a lot of things uh, to just see what works for you. But even from the definition of a startup, it's more of like a repetitive, repetitive process. So you kind of like need to find uh, what really works in terms of the business. But there are those basics that you have to, to have like financial projections, uh, registration of your business. It has to be something that's done because most investors will be most likely to deal with businesses that are already registered. So there's also that personal investment. And again, that also uh, comes from, you, you just don't need to maybe seek investment at the very beginning. You can also uh, do a personal investment or you can get money from family member and friends, uh, getting, getting you uh, over the line to, to maybe even register the business and things like that. So it's very key for you to like, figure out most of the things, especially when it comes to the product and probably the, the structures and systems. And then that's when now you can uh, have conversations uh, on investors. Because I remember, uh, maybe just to touch on this, when I came to Ariel, we didn't figure out much of these things. And um, so we went to we went to pitch uh, to this panel of investors and it wasn't the best of experiences. Uh, and uh, I, I, my, my, my entire team, we, we actually didn't even talk for like an entire week, just trying to figure out what really happened because we were mostly shocked. But again, uh, after, after the week, we went and sat down. So the different areas the investors had uh, talked to us about. And I believe that was more of like a turning point for us because now we started looking at how can we bring all these building blocks together and be able to build uh, something that would be sustainable in the long, long run? I love that that you mentioned that um, towards the end, and that's why we're here as Arrow for Africa to ensure that you know people such as yourself, um, not only as the founders, you've got the information and you've got the system that you need to be able to support you um, to build your business, but you also have that community that will actually fill in the gaps. Um, for what you like, especially when it comes to telling a story um, of what the business um, is all about, where you are in the business and why you want the money. Um, because oftentimes, you know, when you're asking people what do you need as an entrepreneur, the first thing they will say is funds. But actually, the first thing is not necessarily that, you know, you need to have an MVP, you need to have a proof of market, you need to prove if there's actually a gap for the product and service that you actually want to do. And that's why, you know, at Arrow for Africa, we've got um, self-paced programs, we've got bootstrapping and, you know, we've got precision preach. Um, that we do with one of our partners, um, you know, so that you don't have instances like you and your team, unfortunately, had to have 
uh, when you were doing um, that pitch. But, you know, um, Thelma, I know that you not only focus on logistics and e-commerce, but I know that um, it's also one of your passions to be able to connect businesses with markets and to be able to connect businesses um, with manufacturers. And that's something that you do incredibly well, where you're bringing people from um, different points of the globe to go in, you know, and access, um, you know, um, some of the things that they need, cutting out the middleman, which of course um, ensures business growth, lowers, um, you know, some of the operational costs. So if you can tell us, as somebody that is, has been in business, as long as you have, and having engaged with other entrepreneurs that were, you know, up and coming, that are in the startup, what are you finding um, to be the trend when it comes to investors? What are investors um, looking for? And at which point of the business growth are you finding, um, you know, a bulk of the investment? Okay, thank you, uh, Nandi. I think similar to what Moses said, um, definitely with investment, um, you really need to have the product fit or the market fit um, and be able to have governance uh, or system in place, structures in place, and you need to know your, your numbers. So it doesn't really matter what kind of idea you have, because a lot of times we, think we had, need to have this million dollar idea or something outside of the box, but as long as you're able to tell your, your story. I think a lot of times this is something that we unfortunately we're not taught in business school, storytelling, like you said, we need to be able to take the investors through the journey and see, okay, what solution really, what's the impact um, that, you, that your, your, your solution has. So in as much as I think people really just focus on um, the, the profitability, but you need to look at the impact as well, the people, what would you have on your team? What is their background? What is their area of expertise? What is your background? The investors need to know that they need to take comfort in, in, in who they are investing in. So it's really important as well as um, a business owner that you are investable as an individual. I'll say those are the things that I'm, I'm really seeing uh, with investors. And at which point should you raise funds? Um, unfortunately, in southern africa and in zimbabwe particularly it's difficult for smes to get investor funding you find that in the last year only four percent um, of the available funds like uh, for investment in zimbabwe were availed to smes and it's just not your startups this was this is your um middle to large sized uh, businesses. So it's really difficult for startups in, in Zimbabwe to get funding, but I'm happy with uh, what we see going on in East Africa. We have got companies like uh, Bupas, we've got Wowzi, we've partnered with um, uh, MasterCard. So it's really encouraging to see that happening. And we believe that the wave would also come to, to Southern Africa. Um, definitely. I love that. Um, it does indeed take, you know, good intentions and more than a good idea to actually build a sustainable and profitable business. And any investor, of course, they may be, you know, be concerned about the impact, um, you know, not only to the consumer, the environment, but it always does come to the bottom line, the numbers, you know, does it make sense from the perspective of an investor? Yeah. Um, to 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 join to join forces with you and you know what are your insights what are your team um structures like it's very important and like moses said earlier um you know when entrepreneurs start businesses they obviously do it in silos you are the marketer you're the salesperson um you know you're doing branding you're doing marketing and unfortunately um that's where some of the pitfalls and some of the um, the failures that we're seeing um, happening within um, the business space is that you've got one person doing everything. And of course, you are eventually going to reach a point of burnout. You're not going to be able to identify, um, you know, markets um, that you can extend your business, such as the way that you have done. Um, so when we're speaking about emerging markets, when we're speaking about, you know, East Africa and Southern Africa, um, you know, what are some of the, the, the up and coming? 
and most promising sectors that you have identified that are outside maybe of um, you know, your primary portfolio um, of business? Okay, um, I, would, uh, I would say in, um, in Southern Africa, we, we are seeing a lot of potential in e-commerce um, in every way, like um, right hailing is part of, I, I believe it's, it's tech. We're seeing a lot of potential in, in tech. We were behind uh, because of uh, issues to do with internet connectivity, data, I'm happy to see that there's been um, the adoption rate in terms of internet, the penetration rate is improving. I think, we, I believe we're now above 80% in terms of uh, internet um, access, uh, being accessible to, to everyone. So I'm seeing in Southern Africa a lot of potential in, uh, in the tech sector and in the um, uh, agri-tech sector, as well as in e-commerce. We, we now have tech a lot in South Africa. Uh, we have the Korea guy in South Africa. They're doing amazing. And uh, beyond borders logistics ourselves, we are also working on e-commerce platform um, to be able to connect individuals within Africa, to be able to connect SMEs in Africa. So I'm really seeing um, a lot of potential, even in FinTech, we've got a lot of um, the option rate as well or uh, mobile money it's increasing and it's really helping in terms of payments because before we are really a cash economy we believe in money exchanging hands but i'm seeing that now a lot of businesses they are now accepting mobile money to some that was foreign before so i think those are the three areas that i'm seeing a lot of potential in Lovely. Thank you so much for Thelma. So I'd like to mention I did see um, some people raising up um, their hands within um, the meeting. Um, we will definitely have a Q&A session uh, once we're done with the panel discussion. Um, so don't fear, we definitely are going to get to your questions. Um, Moses, I'd like you to jump in um, for me here. Yes, Thelma, you definitely are right. We are seeing, especially even within this um, within the southern region, a move away from money. You know, I know in southern Africa, we are really um, very, um, you know, cash centric. Um, and with, you know, the new tech um, platforms coming up, you're seeing people graduate actually move, um, you know, to mobile money, like, you know, we've seen how it's done in East Africa. And of course, you know, um, I think, you know, we have to move with the times, you know, even with the FCFTA being in place, we, we really can't then still be cash focused because, you know, like you mentioned earlier, we've got different uh, currencies, there's um, inflations, different inflations actually from different key uh, region points. So when it comes to hotspots, you know, on the continent, um, Moses, and even globally, because you, you, you're a person that um, you know has um, your finger on the pulse. You know what's happening globally. You see where the trends are happening, and of course, as somebody within the tech space, you always have to think further than what we're currently seeing now. So, you know, um, apart from you know, we've, we see great, great, great um, ingenuity and great creative, um, creative businesses that are coming from East Africa, Southern Africa. We know the West is also very strong, and also, um, you know, within the northern region of the continent. So, for you, which are the hotspots that you know, um, in investors need to look in, and as, of course, us with our, um, sorry, with our advisory unit. Um, we're constantly looking for entrepreneurs that we can fund from different regions. So which of the hotspots are you um, thinking that one should keep an eye on when it comes to investing? Yeah, uh, so, so that question is normally uh, a very interesting one, considering, uh, number one, uh, you can answer it as an entrepreneur and you can also answer it more of like, in a customer way. So for me, I would say the most interesting areas that investors would likely be looking at is areas where uh, the customer can better get the product. So uh, the product has to work for the customer. So the solution might be very unique. It could be very cool. Uh, but if, if the customer does not use it at the end of the day, whether it's going to be a QR code for payment or some sort of very cool payment method, then it's not worth investing in because at the end of the day, investors would always uh, be looking for an ROI. If you look at it from an entrepreneurial view or entrepreneurial point, then uh, 
most of entrepreneurs would argue uh, technology in a way uh, would be able to provide easier way to, to, to enable customers either do transactions, make payments, receive payments, and all that. So we've seen advancements in blockchain and AI. Uh, we've seen uh, advancements uh, in mobile mobile money pay, uh, payments. We've seen advancements in telegraphic transfers and, and banks catching up as well. So there's there's that there's obviously that uh, kind of uh, opinion, opinionated approach depending on who's the player on. What's the best way to be able to to make uh, payments or to do transactions? So others would say by doing it this way, then you reduce on time, provide efficiency. Others would rely on transparency, like blockchain as a whole is normally centered around transparency, and that would be the argument around that. Uh, with banks, it would be on trust and uh, probably uh, eligibility, credibility, and and all that. Uh, with mobile money, it would be more of conveniency, getting money easily from different places. With what M-Pesa has done, uh, even my grandmother can literally receive money uh, through M-Pesa. So there's that conveniency that's easy to use uh, uh, for, 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 for them and, and for their users. So for, for us, I would say it's more on how best the product can be used or the technological uh, uh, advancement towards a particular product can be used by the general customer. So that's where uh, I would say, even if I was an investor, I would put my money in because at the end of the day, it's the customer that pays for the product. And we have seen so many uh, technological products in, in regards to payments and, and general transactions fail uh, as much as the technology was either very cool or very advanced, fail still, uh, because they they failed to understand uh, how best their customer can use their their product and how best they can also market it to the end consumer. That's that's actually very true, Moses. I mean, we found that you know in our line of business that um, entrepreneurs actually uh, really do struggle uh, with evaluating untapped markets and how to position their businesses. And you find that a lot. Um, you know, they don't actually have the numbers, they don't have the compliance, and they are not document ready when they are approaching um, investors, you know, so, you know, that's why we're offering feasibility studies and business plan through our advisory services so that, you know, we can help entrepreneurs to be able to, um, you know, um, leverage some of the opportunities that we see in coming up globally. Um, and Thelma, you know, we had a discussion um, just off the core about some of the social economic um, challenges that we're seeing, not only on the continent, but just globally when it comes to governance and leadership. So what are some of the, um, you know, the economic challenges that you had, and um, especially maybe governance related um, challenges that you had when you were trying to uh, not only grow your business, but conduct um, business across the different borders um, that you engage in as the Beyond uh, border logistics. So, thank you. Sorry for that. I thought the question was mine. Oh, no, it's okay. You can jump in. Uh, but, Tom, go ahead. Um, uh, so I would say, okay, go on, Moses. Go on, go on. So, I would say for us, it's been more on uh, understanding the different business laws of countries because when we moved to the UK uh, we had to understand uh, being a fintech company we had to understand uh, the do's and don'ts so in terms of licensing in terms of data protection and, and not just the UK because Kenya has been very big on data privacy and data protection uh, also in regards to licensing uh, which was very important uh, just ensuring that you actually are licensed, or even if you're not licensed, at least getting the, the, the permits for uh, that respective uh, jurisdiction uh, was very key for us. Thank you for that, um, Moses. Thelma, do you want to um, just jump in with that and then just um, catching the tail end of what Moses said? Of course, I know being in logistics, you know, you like um, you work a lot with trailers, you work a lot with containers, and of course, you know, there's different permits and licensing um, uh, regulations in different countries. You know, so if you can just touch on what have been some of the challenges when it comes to cross-border trades. I mean, we of course are hearing some of the things that. 
uh, people within your line of work, um, you know, find when they're trying to move maybe from South Africa to Zimbabwe through Bay Bridge. And, you know, some of the challenges that we have there when it comes to um, maybe if I can say poor governance, you know, where you have yeah. to bribe, um, you know, people are held ransom. And, you know, you have obviously being a registered business and having, um, you know, operated a business for as long as you have, you obviously have the compliance, you have the licensing, you have the permit, but on the ground, things are very different. How have you been able to overcome some of those challenges that we're seeing happening um, at those very key points of um, your kind of business? Uh, Nandi, I would say for me, you have to have a level of insanity. <laughs> you have to have something not really okay in your brain to, to be doing business um, in a volatile and uncertain, you know, uh, environment that we are in, first of all. And like you, you mentioned that there is uh, issues of corruption, there are issues of compliance. I'll say one of the biggest challenges for ourselves and other uh, entrepreneurs and startups is the issues of compliance. The cost of compliance is really high because there's no difference um, or recognition of the different levels that um, organizations are on. And I'd say even for ourselves, I believe one of the ways that we can overcome this challenge is having a startup act, you know, that supports uh, startups. In Zimbabwe, we're looking at 60% of the um, GDP of the, uh, the, the GDP of Zimbabwe, uh, the 60% is being contributed by SMEs, but you find that the, the, support, the supporting structures or the, um, the mechanisms to actually recognize how we can nature, how we can grow, how we can support the SMEs, uh, the SMEs is still is still lacking, you know. So one of the challenges that we have faced in trading and in doing uh, cross-border trade is the issues of different customs regulations. You find that uh, Zambia has got different regulations. They apply different tariff rates. South Africa, the same. Uh, you go to Mozambique, each country, it's so disintegrated. And you have to be able to understand and know what each um, country requires on different products. So I'm actually quite happy um, with the African Free Continental Trade Agreement because it's trying to bring together um, uh, the different custom regulations so that within Africa, it's easy to just cross borders. I think that is one of the uh, challenges that we have had and I think the paperwork as well is just a lot that you have to complete. So if we can digitalize those processes instead of having like a folder of, of paperwork, if it can just be done digitally while well you're in your office, the truck gets to the board, and everything's already in the system. You find that there are a lot of waiting periods at the borders and that delay, that time is actually money that you have to be to, to part with. And one of the challenges that we, we, we have because we are supporting a lot of SMEs is the understanding of the risks that come with um, transporting goods. You find that a lot of SMEs already the cost of doing business in the region is quite high. And you talk about insurance, the need for insurance. And it's a foreign um, subject to them they would rather take the risk of transporting uh, their goods and adding that additional cost. So that's one of the challenges that we have had. And if there can be a solution for insurance where SMEs are protected as, as we are transporting their goods, I think we can actually um, improve the cross-border trading. Oh, definitely. Um, I definitely concur with what um, you were saying. Um, you know, we 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 know um, that you know over fifty five percent of um, globally of businesses are owned by SMEs, and you know it's still unfortunate that they are the least developed. Um, you know, which is one of the key reasons why we um, 
is very intentional at Arrow for Africa to, you know, put young people in the forefront of development, of acceleration, and ensuring that not only are they developed as founders, but their businesses are able to buffer some of the challenges that you and Moses have spoken of. Um, so just to have enough time for our Q&A session, um, I would just like to welcome um, anyone that has a question for our speakers to go right ahead before they give us, you know, some of the closing remarks and the parting words. So if you've got any questions um, for any of our speakers, please um, unmute yourself or raise your hand and then we'll have one of the team unmute you so you can um, share your question with the floor. Angu, are you still on the call? I saw that earlier you had um, raised up your hand. You had a question re, um, earlier on um, in the beginning of the webinar. Okay, I'm just gonna go check and see if we've got any questions in the chat box. Okay, um, I see that we had a comment from Mary who was saying that um, when you're looking at, you know, um, technology within a business and in regards to some upcoming trends, you know, um, a lot of businesses um, maybe should consider adding content creation, you know, as you've done, I guess, as a Gen Z, I think that a comment is for you, Moses, and across Africa. So just um, when we're touching on that, because we didn't really speak on branding and marketing, how have you been able to um, to do that, to grow your business, you know, how have you been, been able to garner support, not only from, you know, business development um, organizations, but just generally, how have you been able to get your business out there? you know, and let the consumer know who you are and let the market um, know how, you know, you are different and what your unique value proposition is. Uh, so what we did was we tried to be as close to the point of sale as possible. So what we do at Investor Farm is we generally provide loans uh, to farmers. Uh, where, uh, where do we get these farmers? These farmers mostly buy their inputs from different agricultural centers. So these are cultural centers either belong to the government or belong to specified registered or licensed uh, input providers. So what we've done is we've gone into these agricultural stores and then that's the point where we sell our loans. So when every farmer walks in, then there's the option of actually taking a loan to be able to get the inputs from these specific points. Uh, just ensuring that we're closest to these specific uses. In regards to general content, uh, a way of reaching out to, I'd say, the genes. Uh, we've seen, we've seen. So when we were starting off, uh, our target was mostly women and working with women. But we've seen uh, great interest from the youth, and that's now why we move like uh, sort of like divided uh, our business line. So we have a specific. So I'd call it white listing, but it's not really white listing where we have, we specifically uh, have like a, a program where we finance the youth. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a name, we've, we've given the entire program. So it's kind of like a pilot which we run with, with different youth groups. And then we treat that business as a separate business to our main business uh, uh, in terms of marketing, in terms of resource allocation, in terms of how we reach out to them, in terms of how uh, we onboard them as well, so we onboard them separate, differently from how we onboard our general farmers. So we've tried to have that as a separate business, and it has kind of like also helped us to be able to also get uh, different information in regards to, because again, like I said, that has been really key for us in terms of growing the business and making it work. So we've been able to also just uh, get enough data to be able to build on that particular area in a sustainable manner. Um, you know, 
Um, through advisory, agriculture is one of the areas that we focus in when we are helping businesses, you know, get investor ready, we're helping them with our feasibility studies. So, you know, a question that I have for you, Moses, um, you know, as somebody who understands the agricultural landscape and some of the risks that you see, especially within the production level, how, how best do you prepare some of the farmers that are on board and on investor farms? How do you best help them buffer some of the, cha the changes that we seeing because you know you can um, have preparation and plan all you like for a season um, but you know due to cl uh, climatic shocks you will find that farmers are losing their entire harvest overnight so how have you grown your business to be able um, you know to to close some of the gaps um, or foresee some of the challenges within that very very primary level of production for the farmers that are onboarded on investor farms so a very interesting question again. Uh, so like like I said, with Investor Farm, it's been more blind along the way and trying to build the platform, like you mentioned. Uh, we have we've had issues of, uh, of of farmers losing their harvest uh, due to climate change and the likes of that. So we went ahead to uh, embed insurance onto our platform. And with this, we're working with a close corporate partner that's also an investor within the company. Uh, so we use their technology embedded insurance onto our product so that if we have instances where farmers are not able to pay due to either drought, pests and diseases, or if the farmers are able uh, are, are, are sick and are not able to like repay on time. Uh, so what we generally ensure is basically the credit line, the, the period by which the farmer is uh, supposed to be paying back uh, the loan through the platform. Uh, something again uh, we've tried to do, which uh, I would say has been really difficult, is trying to close in the different gaps along the value chain. So uh, we've tried to, as much as possible to deal with farmers that are either into contracts with either off-takers, so they already have already uh, already implemented off-takers, already set up off-takers, so people that buy their produce from them, or they basically have, uh, so there's like less risks involved in terms of like, uh, the general loan acquisition process and repayment. So working with different partners, uh, either in the taking space, so telling them we have a group of women that we're financing, they're growing uh, probably potatoes, and we would love for you guys to uh, get your potatoes for, from, from them. So these guys come do their due diligence as a business. And then once we, we find that approved, then we're able to finance these women because uh, it also it becomes less risk, less risky for our business uh, offering uh, belongs to this particular farmer. So it's more of like uh, I would say it's not really a clear process or a clear path in terms of like just working with the farmers. But now what we've done is we normally take the best deal, the best deal in terms of off takers, the best deal in terms of uh, of the repayment plan and how it's going to look like. Um, in closing, um, of course, Lama, you know, I know that um, through um, your business, you, you know, you've got access to a lot of sectors. I um, mean, you know, you also, like us, are very, um, you know, invested in developing SMMEs and um, entrepreneurs. Um, so what would be, you know, your advice to um, a young entrepreneur that's looking to grow their business, that's looking to go into a, sim a similar sector such as yours? Um, or even looking to grow their business out of, you know, the region and the continent? Um, thank you. I'll say that um, Moses mentioned earlier on about data. Definitely data is the new, the new currency. So as you are looking to grow your business, as you're looking to expand into other regions, you need to understand those different markets. You need to have the date on the different markets and the potential that is there. And I'll just also add on to say, you know, is um, uh, research has it that by 2050, one third of the world's youth population will be living in Africa. And that is something that you then need to think about. Say, okay, why is it going to be like that? And what opportunities then uh, does this represent? And if we are looking at the youth, we're looking at the Gen Z, um, what data is there around the Gen Z? Um, what are the opportunities that this uh, represents? 
and I just want to speak on fear. A lot of uh, times of um, the environment, the economic environment that most of us find ourselves in, we actually have that fear to say, is this going to work out? And then we're waiting for somebody to come and start a business and say, oh, this is actually a great business. And then everyone kind of like follows. Let us just step out of that fear and be pioneers in our different industry. If you want to expand to Kenya, reach out to the people in those markets already, talk to them, find out how it's like, how business they is like, what are the opportunities, the challenges that they are facing. It can then inform your decision. So I'll just say, if not you, then who? Everyone else has got a plan for Africa. A few weeks back, I was in China, and it's amazing what plans have for Africa. So if everyone else has plans for Africa, what do we have? We need to have a plan for Africa ourselves, and we just cannot afford to let Africa down. Incredible, and you're so right, Thamar. Uh, we all have a responsibility, um, you know, to develop um, the continent and leave it better, not only, um, you know, for our families, but for future generations. Thank you so much for those parting words. And Moses, what would you like to um, to share um, with those that are in the room? You know, what um, what words of encouragement do you want to share with us and you know just some words of you know how they can better navigate um in the entrepreneurship landscape um not only within the continent but um, globally I, I feel uh knowing your customer is kind of this uh, is kind of like uh, a good way to start building regardless of where you are or where you're going uh, more emphasis again on knowing your customer and knowing the problem you're solving for your customer because that's uh, that that is going to tell quite a lot so knowing your why is going to tell whether you're going to make money uh it's going to tell whether uh you're going to if, if you're in need for investment whether investors will be convinced uh to, to give you their money um and also in terms of just um ensuring that your business is done sustainable so uh, trying as much as possible to understand the problem and understanding the customer. And, and we've seen successes with the likes of M-Pesa, building around the customer and growing to, to be that big uh, across Africa. And, and the same to, to other solutions as well that have uh, been customer-centric, as opposed to what entrepreneurs mostly focus on, which is the solution. So you really have a great product, uh, a nice-looking one, very good uh, user flow, but uh, the question would now come in on um, who's going to use uh, your product at the end of the day. So you have to be really, really interested to know so much about your customer because when you know your customer, then you're able to know uh, what what other people are doing that you're probably going to do. And, and it's actually, I normally find uh, conversations or talks uh, of people saying, I, I probably have a better product that I, than M-Pesa, very ignorant uh, because for, for M-Pesa to be where it is, uh, there's definitely uh, something they've done uh, to, to, to get them there. So if, if we're able to learn more from, from the customer um, and then build around around them um, in terms of uh, the solution, then we're able to, to get ourselves uh, to a different level uh, as founders, as businesses, or as companies. Incredible. Um, thank you very much to both you, Moses and Thamar. Um, this has indeed been such an engaging um, exchange of knowledge. You know, um, some of the takeaways that I'm taking away, um, you know, from the session is, you know, um, being consumer centric, like Moses mentioned, growing with your customer, understanding their needs, anticipating their needs, doing your research. And of course, having a very futuristic outlook. And of course, you know, as we've always known, Africa is the answer, not only for us as Africans, but even for some of the global challenges that we're looking, you know, be purpose driven, be alert, be willing to learn and be prepared to always be learning, especially as an entrepreneur, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to build um, 
you know, an impactful and sustainable business. Um, please do remember that you can connect with us as Errol for Africa through our LinkedIn page. We are Errol for Africa Limited. We also have Errol Advisory. You can also connect with us through Instagram. We are Errol for Africa on Instagram and also Errol for Africa and Errol for Advi Errol Advisory on Instagram. And of course, you can reach out to uh, Moses and Thelma. They also have pages on LinkedIn. Thelma's page is um, Beyond Borders Logistics and Moses' page is Investor Farms. Once again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and for joining us for our webinar. We, of course, will have um, other webinars that will be coming up in um, the months ahead. So please um, do stay tuned and follow those pages that I mentioned. So you'll be seeing our updates and you'll be learning more about our advisory services and our training programs and capacity um, development programs that we offer as Arrow for Africa. I wish you, um, you know, a pleasant evening, a pleasant day and a pleasant good morning, depending where you are in the continent and of course, globally. Goodbye, thank you.